Hey guys, Stephanie Mitchell here. So if you are a hairdresser or a beauty business owner, you've probably thought before about going out on your own as either a booth renter or a suite renter, or maybe you are a boothie or a suite renter right now. If you are, there are some very particular things that you need to know about running your business, about getting clients, making more money, setting your pricing, how your business plan is different from other businesses out there. Fortunately for us, we have an expert in the house today. Nina Tulio has owned salons, run her own salons for 20 years in the beauty industry. She sold her business and several years ago, she started a coaching business called N1 Agency for hairdressers and beauty business owners. And she's particularly passionate about helping booth renters and suite renters to grow their business and make more money. I am so excited about this interview because Nina gives so many tips, amazing tips about how to set your pricing, how to work out your profits and your expenses, how to write a business plan, um, and some important financial and practical considerations about going out on your own. So can't wait to show you the interview. Let's get started. So Nina, I'm so, so, so excited to have you with me here today. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. This is awesome. Yeah, me too. So um, today's we're chatting all about booth renters and sweet renters and how they can build their business, make more money and kind of get started going out on their own. If there's someone watching who's in the beauty industry and hasn't gone into that yet, this is for them as well. So Nina, tell us about yourself and just like a little bit about your background in the beauty industry and what you do now in your business. Yes, of course. So I'm actually, this is my 24th year in the beauty industry and I eat, sleep and breathe this industry. It truly is my passion. Um, people are my passion, to be honest. I'm just fortunate enough that I get to do what I love to do in this beautiful industry. Um, I started out as a hairstylist. I was a hairstylist on and off for 20 years. Um, in that time, I was a district manager for a local chain of salons back in Pennsylvania. And so I wasn't cutting hair during some of that time. And then I decided to open up my own salon, which I owned for 11 years. That was also in Pennsylvania. And I was a hairstylist behind the chair, was a salon owner, and decided to you know, the goal was actually to sell the salon. You know, I, I wanted to transition it that way and sell it. And it was just a good time. So it was a two year strategy. I sold my salon in 2016. My husband and I ended up moving to Connecticut for his job. And I started one N agency, which is the consulting business that I do now. And I've been so this is year three for me doing this. And I have been so fortunate and so blessed to work with amazing stylists and salon owners literally around the country, but also around the world, because I do a lot of virtual coaching and have online education with people mm -hmm. all over the world, which has been really cool. So that's the short, the long and short of my journey over the past 24 years. Wow. I love it. So you've experienced a lot and now your passion is for helping other business owners to figure out, okay, how do I exactly do this and grow my business and that kind of thing. So why are you so passionate about the booth renter and the salon sweet renter side of things. Cause I know this is something that, you know, I wanted to chat with you about because you're such an expert and so passionate about it. Why is that business model specifically so important? So, well, uh, to be honest, my first, the reason why I started this business one an agency was because I wanted to help commission salon owners. Um, because I was a commission salon owner and I did really well as a commission salon owner. And I also really tanked as a commission salon owner. I made a lot of mistakes in my first five years was really rough for me. So that was the basis of this, um, of what I'm doing. And then over the past couple of years, it's really evolved and changed with the industry. And I just love to love and I love to help. So I really started to do more research as the industry started to shift and change with going from helping commission salon owners to helping commission hairstylists and now really diving into the suite owner and the rentership with, I have a lot of clients that I work with that are suite owners and renters. And I really wanted to dive deep and really create a system that could work well for them because I know a lot of suite owners and renters that are doing really well, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of them that are really struggling. Yeah. And it's very important for me to help everyone in the industry level up and grow and become a little bit more business savvy. So they 
can have and create a sustainable business. So that's kind of where I'm at, you know, right now, of course I'm helping everyone, but the sweet thing really pulls at my heartstrings because I know that people are investing in their business yeah. with, you know, starting a suite and they're not seeing a return on that investment. Yeah. So why do you think that that is like, why do you think that so many people, I mean, they get the courage and, and the guts and it, it takes a lot to be able to go out on your own and mm-hmm. that's amazing. But why do you think that there is such, um, such a prevalence of people doing that and kind of like not being able to make a lot of money or kind of have a hard time figuring out the business side of things. So here's the thing, and this is what I learned over time and also with salon owners as well. Just because you're a great hairstylist and you're a busy hairstylist doesn't mean that you necessarily are going to be a great business owner because you're now putting on a different hat. And when you are a salon owner, it's different because now you're leading a team of people. What I have found in the suite renter model is that a lot of stylists make the decision to go into being a suite owner and renter either prematurely or they make their decision based out of emotion, Mm -hmm. meaning they're frustrated where they are with their salon or their salon owner or that business. And they're like, this isn't working for me. So, Hey, I'll just go rent a suite because on the outside looking in, it looks very easy. Well, if he can do it or she can do it, I can do it too. But in all actuality, it's, it's a business and you're running your own business and all of the things that the salon owner was doing for you or supposed to be doing for you. Um, you now have to do yourself. So it's premature. Um, and it is emotionally driven at times, but then also, um, sweet owners and renters get in there and they realize how hard it is yeah. and then they pull out, right? Mm-hmm. Because they can't afford it. And then there's, there's also this um, statistic out there as well that shows that people who are renting suites, hairstylists are leaving because they're lonely mm-hmm. and they're not used to working alone, just one-on-one with a, with a client. Yeah. And it works really well for some people, but a lot of hairstylists like the camaraderie and the chatting and the talking and, Hey, what color should I mix or what lightener should I use? They yeah. don't have that, that kind of bonding experience mm-hmm. when you're in a suite by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That loneliness of being an entrepreneur, it takes some time to adjust to, and then you have to figure out other ways to kind of make up for it. Sure. Um, so can you tell us, you said that a lot of people go out on their own prematurely. How mm-hmm. do you know when you are ready to actually go out on your own and how can you make sure that you're actually ready to face the reality of it? So, and that's a great question. And I get that question a lot actually. And so there are a couple key components that you want to look at. First things first, you really want to make sure that you're financially secure enough to move into a suite. If you're going to move into a suite, you have to have working capital, Mm -hmm. even though it's not as much as if you're going to, you know, move into a brick and mortar building, you still have to design that suite and kind of decorate it and make it your own. Um, there's furniture in there. Yes, but maybe you want to make it your own. So are you swapping out? Are you adding in sinks? What are you doing with furniture? So you want to make sure that you have a little nugget of cash for you to be able to do that. And then also having set aside at least two to three months of your expenses just for cushion. Mm -hmm. Um, so just in case something happens because now you're a one man show. So just in case something happens, you have that cushion there for yourself to be able to function and operate because if you're not in your business, you're not making money. Um, so capital and finances are very important. Um, also you want to make sure. And so there are some stylists that are coming out of school and going into suites. There are maybe a handful of them that I know that have been successful and are doing very well, Mm -hmm. but the majority and, and to give yourself some security, it's really great to be at least 85% booked before you think about moving into a suite because When you move into another location, whether it's a suite or you're going to rent a chair, um, typically you lose about 30% of that revenue. Mm -hmm. So you have to be prepared for that. And so 85% booked at least gives you a little bit of cushion. And now you can, if you go into your suite or a chair, you can, you know, start to build yourself back up without taking a huge impact on your revenue. Um, The other thing I want to add is that there's a misconception out there that suite owners and renters keep all the money. So there's a little bit of friction going on right now between salon owners and it's always been this way, but salon owners and commission stylists, because the stylists think that the owner keeps all of the money. Mm -hmm. And we know that that's not true because typically in our industry, a commission salon owner owner will only make around 8% profit. So when you're thinking about if you're a, if you are a commission stylist, or even if you're thinking about converting um, to suite or uh, chair renter, you know wherever you're at in your career, you now have to understand that 
are you really going to be making that much more money? Because now there's a time commitment that goes along with this. Mm -hmm. You're taking care of all of the Instagram, all of the Facebook, all of the marketing, all of the advertising. You're taking care of your books. You're doing QuickBooks or whatever platform you use. So you're investing a lot more time. So that way it's nice when you know that you're at least 85% booked, you're not going to have to spend too much time attracting new business. You really have to just focus on retaining the business that you have. So Those are just, I mean, I could go on and on, but those are the few, the financial aspect is really important. And I think it's being secure, you know, when you are booked and you have a good client base that gives you the security knowing that, you know, is everyone going to follow you? No, that's just not how it works in this business, but at least you have security knowing that the majority of them will. Um, and even if you lose that 30%, what I like to teach suite owners and renters is I go through their numbers with them Mm -hmm. and say, this is where you're at. And if you lose 30% off the top, this is where you're going to be. Can you survive in your business? Not only with your business, but personally, because now you have to personally cover all of your personal expenses and your business expenses. Um, so we kind of go through all that. So I think financial security is most important. Yeah, yeah. In this aspect, yeah. So I want to chat with you more about kind of like the numbers side of things, understanding mm-hmm. what those costs are, because you said um, you have to have like two to three months of your um, of your expenses saved up, so that no matter what happens, you're right. still good. So I want to ask you some about the financial part, but before we get there, um, so you were talking essentially about making sure that you're ready to go out on your own, Mm -hmm. um, making sure that you're at least 85% booked out, um, because it can be very, very tough to make it on your own. Plus, like you said, you have all of the finances, you have new expenses that you didn't have before. Um, you have to deal with your own marketing and your Instagram and everything like that. So there's a lot of hard parts to it, but maybe you could show us the flip side first of like, what are some of the amazing opportunities and some of the really exciting benefits of being on your own and renting a suite or renting a booth? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's always pros and cons to everything, right? It's just finding what really works and feels good for you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I always like to know going into it, what some of those cons would be, but of course there's amazing pros with being a suite owner and a renter. And what I have found in doing research is that most, most hairstylists want freedom and flexibility. Yeah. So they want to be able to control their schedule. They want to be able to come and go as they please. They want to be able to have the freedom to take off on a Saturday and go see their son or daughter's soccer game or whatever it looks like. So the freedom aspect of it is awesome. However, you're still building a business. So it's not like you can just take off whenever you want and show up one day a week, right? You still have to be consistent with your schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, The other part of it too is, I think salon stylists like to have control over their future and control over the amount of money they're making and control over their schedule and control over the types of clients that they see. So being in a suite and being in a rentership position will allow you to do that. Now, obviously you have to be, you have to educate yourself on how to do those things. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are all the flip side, which is really great side of being able to control your financial future Mm -hmm. and control the amount of money that you bring into your space and control your expenses. So you know what your bottom line is going to be. So there are so many um, positives with being a suite owner and a renter. And those are just, just a few right off the top of my head that I know that stylists are really excited about yeah. in, in this side. Yeah. I love that. I mean, there's to me, at least there's nothing better than being your own boss. And like you said, no matter how hard it can be, you have that freedom to be able to choose what kind of business you want to grow. And that's right. so, so powerful. Um, So I also wanted to ask you, um, do you feel like before someone takes the leap to actually go out on their own um, Mm -hmm. before maybe they put in their notice um, and they save up their money and that kind of thing, do you feel like they actually need a business plan in order to, for example, be a sweet renter? And if so, what should that business plan have in it? So absolutely. Yes. Because so if we want to consider ourselves entrepreneurs or solopreneurs, then we have to take it seriously. Right. So it's kind of like if you were to just dive into a business and not do any research and not do your homework or any projections, financial projections. So the business plan and, and what, why I highly recommend doing a business plan is because 
it actually lays out what your next two years are going to look like mm-hmm. in terms of your revenue and then your expenses. And yes, it is a projection. However, you already have your feet wet. Typically, if you've been in the business for a while and you're busy and you have your clients, you can already kind of take the revenue and service sales and retail of what you have now and convert that into a business plan. So it just lays everything out pretty systematically for you. Um, you want to make sure that you have everything, the timelines that are laid out. Mm-hmm six months, one year, and then, you know, a year and a half and two years. So you can see where you're growing and where your business is going. So you're not just like, Hey, let's just hope for the best. And I hope that all my clients come with me, but it allows you to see and dive deeper into your demographic, into your target market, your mission, your bit, your vision for your business. Because if you're in a suite, you are running a business. Mm -hmm. And so having a mission and being very clear on who you are and what your brand is and what your brand promises is all in your business plan. So I'm going to be straight up doing a business plan is a pain. (laughs) It is such a pain. I did obviously did it for my salon business and I was dreading this whole thing. And I thought, Oh, it's very, very time consuming and it can take months at times And I know that you guys want to just get out there and you want to do this, but I want you to do it right. And I would rather have you take the time to do it right instead of just kind of taking a stab at the dark and Mm. then leaving after a year. Yeah. So do the business plan as much of a pain, do it. Yeah. So essentially, first of all, in your business plan, you talk about, okay, what's your vision for your business? Where do you Mm -hmm. want to grow it? Um, What's your mission? What makes you unique, I guess, as a business? Um, Talking Mm -hmm. about your clientele, um, your target audience and yes. what kind of demographics you're targeting. Um, and then like you said, the financial projections, what are, mm-hmm. what's going to be your revenue, what's going to be your expenses, I guess at different points. So like mm-hmm. six months from now, a year from now, is there anything else that should be included in the business plan? And how do you know, like whether it's good or not? Like, how do you know how, how in depth you need to go? So there are templates that you can actually, you can just go on sba.gov, sba.gov, mm-hmm. and they have business plans on there that are very, very helpful and very in-depth. Um, there are different business plans out there. Obviously, some are very, very in-depth and some are a little bit more surface. Um, it just depends on how in-depth you want to be and how specific you want to be. Um, but you can also add some market research into your target demographic in your area and key location that will really help you too. I mean, I think because most, not all, but most people, most stylists that are moving into a suite position, um, have been doing this for a while. So they are aware of their clientele that they have. But when you're starting to think bigger and think of growing and scaling a business, you really want to become very clear on exactly who you are, who you want to spend your time with. Like you said, what makes you unique, what your brand mission and promises. And I think it really, the, it all starts with you. So first of all, you have to know who you are first as a hairstylist, because it's not about like, and I, and I shared a post about this on my Instagram. Um, I specialize in balayage and haircuts and men's haircuts and long haircuts and updos and if you're a specialty, then it's only one or two things and you master those. Mm-hmm. So you really want to kind of close in on your craft and then close in on what really makes you stand out. And one of the most important things is the why behind it all. Yeah. The why behind it all is the driving force behind everything that you do. So you have to become very clear on that and the business plan will help you along with that. Yeah, I love that. And I feel like it's so overlooked because I know for myself, when I first started my business, I just went where the wind took me. I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. whatever kind of clients I can get or however I'll make money, that's great. And that works for the first little bit. But then after a while, after about a year or so, you look back and you're like, oh, this is not really where I wanted to go. This isn't really the business that I kind of wanted to build. I just went wherever the wind took me. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I I totally get why it's so important to have those really, really clear goals. Um, so in your business plan, should you also look at what other businesses are out there? Kind of like your competition. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the thing. I always say, focus on who you are and what you have to offer and have one eye on what's going on outside. Right. Because we can't really dive in and focus on what they're doing. If this also comes into pricing and I know we'll, we'll probably talk about Mm -hmm. that, but you know, you can't call down the street and look at Judy salon and say, okay, she's charging X, Y, Z. So that sounds good for me. 
there's so much more that goes into it. And so it's the same thing when you're talking about creating a business plan, yeah. you want to know who your competition is and you want to have a feel of it, but you're not going to base your business off of their theirs because then it's not going to be your own. Exactly. So a little bit of market research for sure. Yeah. And ties into kind of demographic as well. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about the financial side. So a really mm-hmm. important part of your business plan and before you're ready to go out on your own, you need to know your numbers. You need to know mm-hmm. your expenses, your pricing, your profit margin, all of that good stuff. So where do you think is a good place to start when kind of planning out your business? You start with your pricing. So the first thing that I love to talk about, and I, I love when people reach out to me and they want to become renters and suite owners. Cause my first question is to me, do you know your current numbers, meaning your service sales, your RTS percentage, your pre-booking percentage, your retention, which is incredibly important. Um, and your head count, new head count per week, per day. Do you know all of this first? Okay. And you would be so surprised at how many hairstylists do not. And yeah. it's okay because right they're they're just not um, paying attention to this stuff or they haven't been taught. Yeah. Or so and the, because they're working for somebody else, they're like, oh, well, my boss deals with that. I'm just an employee. Right. But That's, I mean, I just think that we, as commission stylists, you should also know that. And when you're in a commission platform, it all depends on the leader of the business. Like I, my business was very numbers. Um, it was people driven, of course, that was first, but behind the scenes, we did one-on-one coaching sessions every month, team meetings. So my girls were very, very focused. They knew what percentage they should be at their benchmarks. We posted numbers every week. So if you're trained that way, then obviously it's a thing. And a lot of people are not. And so my first thing for you is to look at your current numbers, your current statistics, you know, what your RTS percentage, that's your retail to service percentage because retail is important. And, you know, you're with your retention because a lot of focus is always on, we've got to get new guests. And it's not always about getting those new guests. Do you have to pay attention to getting new guests? Absolutely. But more so you need to focus on how you're retaining them because you're going to spend more time and money attracting a new guest than you would be retaining the ones that you already have. So that's the first part of it. Because that's just the basics and the fundamentals of being a hairstylist and knowing your own numbers. Mm -hmm. Then the other side of it is your business numbers and financials. So what I can share, because I go into all of this stuff because it's so in depth. But yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, but I want to just give them something to think about Mm -hmm. because the first thing really that you have to understand is that your rent percentage is probably one of the most important percentages aside from your supplies percentage. Um, and this is all based in comparison to your revenue. Okay. So you are allotted a 12% rent that is going to allow you to throw a higher profit. So on average, the suite owner renter business model is slotted on average between 25 and 35% profit. There are some that are doing 40, 45, 50% profit, and there are some that are 15% profit, right? But we're kind of in that window. Yeah. So when you know your rent percentage going in, and this is the one of the first things we talk about on the business side is, okay, tell me what your weekly rent is going to be. And then I want to know what your numbers are now, what your service and retail numbers are now. And I'm going to tell you right now where your rent percentage would be if you moved into that suite. Okay. And now are you going to be at a 12% right when you go in? You may not be. And that's okay because you're, you have room to grow your business, mm-hmm. right? But you know, 15%, okay. 16%, okay. I can work with that. But when we start getting in 20, 25, 30, I've, I've seen rents that are 35% rents. And then you're in the danger zone. It's like, Hey, you're spending way too much High money alert. compared yes. to what you're bringing in. Yes. And so if you start out with a really high rent like that, the only way that your rent percentage goes down is if we increase your revenue. Yeah. No one's ever going to say, oh, hey, you're not doing well. Let's lower your rent. Like that doesn't happen. So the only way that we can decrease that is if we increase our revenue. And it's very hard to do if you don't have a marketing strategy, if you don't have a brand and you don't have branding, Mm -hmm. it's hard to be able to do that. And then you have to worry about attracting them. And now you have to worry about keeping them. So there's a lot of stuff going on that you have to worry about. So, but the rent percentage is one of the key drivers of that 25 to 35% profit. And 
it's important to know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. And so some rents could be two, three, four, five hundred dollars a week, depending on where you are in your location. Yeah. Um, and if your revenue sustains that, then great. Good for you. Right. Knowing that you're going to build a little bit and how much can you build if you're 85 percent booked already? You don't really have that much room to grow. Are you yeah. going to have a price increase? Like, where is that? Where's the extra you know, where, you where is that extra from? coming from? Yeah, so for sure. So when you're planning out, um, like when you're building your business plan, when you're planning on going out on your own, mm -hmm. should you, if you feel like you're looking at a space and you're like, oh my gosh, this place is so cute. It costs $200 a week, for example, but that's much more than 12% of the revenue that I could potentially bring in. Is it better to essentially find a place that's less expensive that is more in that 12% range or just kind of like cross your fingers and hope that you can build up your revenue? Well, it all depends on how much higher it is of a 12%. Right. If it's 14, 15, 16, 17, like you're in the window. Once we get beyond 20%, and you're 70, 75, 80% booked, you don't have a lot of wiggle room there yeah. because there's nowhere else to go unless you bring on an assistant, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have to have a plan for them, a growth plan. You have to pay them and afford them. So there's a whole other side to that too. So I always say err on the side of caution yeah. that you want to play it safe first and don't hyper extend yourself starting at a 25% rent, 30% rent, knowing that that's where the majority of your money is going to be going every single month. And that's a lot. Yeah. So again, you're never going to not, I shouldn't say never, but most likely are you going to be right at that 12% right off the rip? Probably not. But as long as you're in, you know, four, five, six, seven percent of that, like mm -hmm. that's workable, right? Yeah. But when you get above 20, you're in, you're in the red zone. Yeah. I mean, it's very scary in that zone. Okay. Okay. So we got to watch out for that. So once you find your perfect place and it looks mm -hmm. like it's within your price range, yep. what are the next kind of financial considerations that you need to make? So we're not, are we open yet or are we still, are we getting open? Oh, <laughs> like well, where are let's, we let's look game? at like <laughs> if you're making your business plan and you're trying to like okay. come up with the right numbers for your business. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so Yes. So now we have, we already talked about putting money aside. Mm -hmm. Now we want to know how much this space is actually going to cost to rehab. So how much money initially, so working capital, do you need in terms of getting a brand and line of products? Yeah. What lines are you going to carry? How many lines are you going to carry? Um, do you need a full color line? What, like all of those, that's the consumable side of it. Foil, cotton, all of the things that people don't really think about what does that opening order look like for you? And then on the other side, it is decor. So if you're moving to a suite, you typically don't have to do too much, yeah. but I've worked with um, quite a few suite owners that are moving into their space and they're looking at spending between five and 10 grand easy just yeah. in their little spot to, you know, rehab it and furniture and paint and wallpaper and shelving and opening orders, all of that stuff, you know? Yeah. So it really can add up quickly. So I'd say five to 10 initial upfront just to have for decor opening order could be safe. It could be more, it could be less, just kind of giving you a range, yeah. but you want to have that cash on hand because I do get questions about people asking me if they should take out a loan for this. My always and gut check yourself, but my initial to that is you want to go in this with no debt. So I suggest that if you're thinking of doing this, that you start saving now mm -hmm. and start siphoning off money before it even hits your account, create your own separate savings account. Yeah. That is just going to be for your new model and start sending money over there. And then when you have the five, 10, eight grand, whatever it is that you need after you do your business plan and you figure out what your opening costs are going to be, then you pull the trigger okay. because you don't want to have a loan payment. You don't want to pay interest. You don't want to have that looming and hanging over your mm -hmm. head. So those would be all of the next steps that I would take. Okay. Figure out what are going to be all those expenses of opening up your place. Mm -hmm. All right. So once you've done that, is it then time to determine like how you're going to set your pricing or what's the next step after that? Yeah. So, I mean, part of it, you're probably going to be working on pricing along the way with yeah. this because this is one of the hardest things to figure out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of questions that I get from sweet, um, people who are moving into suites and rentership is, should I keep my pricing the same or should I increase them when I move? Yeah. So here's the thing, your clients and people in general do not like a lot of change. So you can't 
hit them with the, oh, by the way, I'm leaving and I'm moving five, 10 miles away. So we're going to take you to a new location. And then by the way, I'm changing my color line. And then by the way, we're having a price increase. Yeah. Like you got to hit people in small doses, mm-hmm. right? So ahead of time, you should already be planning your pricing with your expenses and your target profit wrapped into it. Okay. You should be wrapping pricing um, profit into your pricing and And it also pricing goes into a lot of things like how booked out are you? How much money are you spending on education? What your demographic is? So a lot of things to consider. And then I suggest you move in with your same pricing and then six months later or so, then you can have an increase that you announce. Everybody's settled. You've got six months under your belt so you can see the ebb and flow of your expenses Mm -hmm. and where you are. And then you can make the right decision to raise your prices based on facts, yes. right? Now you have all the information that you need. So, um, and you do what you feel is best for your business. That's just what I have seen over time that it's too much change. And when you're moving and you're raising prices and you're changing all of the things, sometimes clients get overwhelmed and you want to make sure that, um, they're happy because mm-hmm. they're affording you your lifestyle, right? Yeah. Not that you're, you have to cater every little thing to them, but you have to do this with their consideration in mind as well. Of course. Okay. So, wait a little bit of time and then look at, okay, how do I increase my prices? What would be Mm -hmm. a fair increase? And also taking into consideration your profit margin, your expenses, everything like that. Yes. Um, Okay. So that's all awesome. And then I also wanted to talk with you about some of like the really important numbers that business owners need to keep in mind for their business that maybe before when they were working somewhere else, they didn't really think that much about them. So Um, you were mentioning, um, before when I read your blog post about this, I absolutely loved it. So you were talking about retention, frequency, and average ticket. Can you talk to Mm -hmm. us about those numbers that are so, so, so crucial to know? Sure. So a lot of times, um, you know, and as a former hairstylist, we get comfortable. So we kind of feel like, oh, I'm doing great or I'm doing well. And then when you really open the book and, or look in the computer and you're like, Oh my God, I haven't seen Karen in six months. I thought she was just here. Like it's really making sure that you have a pulse on how you're growing, but also having a a pulse on money that could be, that you could be losing within the business. So when we talk about average ticket frequency of visit and, um, average ticket frequency of visit, and there was the, uh, retention. Retention, When we talk, when we talk about those numbers, that's where I find that people are losing the most money. So as a suite owner and renter, you can say to yourself, if I increase six of my clients, and I talk about this in my classes, I just talked about it the other day. So if I increase six of my clients from a six week to a four week, depending on your average ticket, that could be thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. found money in your business, right? If I can just increase my average ticket $5, depending on how many clients you're doing and how many um, what your average ticket is, that could be thousands of dollars mm-hmm. over the year, right? Yeah. So it's really paying attention to daily how many clients you're seeing, how many of them are new, what your average ticket is. Is it climbing or is it decreasing? Do you need to add on services? Are you talking about conditioning treatments and glosses and all of those things? Mm-hmm. Um, and really, if you have Karen coming and every time she comes and she's like, man, my roots are so bad, this I see my gray and it's driving me crazy and you keep noticing a trend, say to her, we need to switch you up, girl. You have to start coming in every four weeks instead of six. It's really then paying attention to the details and understanding that, yes, this is where I need to be. And this is how many people I need to see at this average ticket. So the real, it's a very systematic way that you should be looking at your numbers every day, every week and every month. Yeah. I love that saying, um, it can't be managed if it's not measured. So you don't Mm, really mm -hmm. know that there's a problem. You don't even know that you have to change anything until you actually dive into the numbers and you're like, Oh wow. Like I probably really good work on this side of like the retention and the right. average ticket, that kind of thing. Um, so is there anything else? Um, you talked about, uh, frequency of visit and average ticket. Can, can you talk about retention as well? Sure. So re- I am so passionate about retention mm-hmm. because it is one of the simplest ways for you to continue to keep your business thriving and growing. And it's one of the most overlooked things in yeah. our industry. It's changing, but there's again, so much focus on attracting that we forget to pay attention to our bread and butter clients yeah. that are loyal every single day. So 
uh, something that is very important is looking at the because there's typically a breakdown of a new guest retention percentage and an existing percent um, existing retention guest percentage. And um, it's important to look at both of them. Industry wide, we struggle with new guest retention. Right. If you can get that client to come back three times, now they turn into an existing guest, yeah. right? So looking at your numbers now, point of sale systems will do this for you. Doing it manually is going to be more accurate for you, but it typically is spread three, four months over time, depending on if you're doing balayage services, how often are you, are your people coming back? There's a lot of, um, things that go into that, but I would love for you to start paying more attention to the fact that, wow, I got 10 new clients this week and only two of them returned. That's a problem, right? Yeah. I would rather have you get five new guests and have all of them return mm -hmm. right now. It's a hard for you to have every single guest return. Right. But the, obviously the, the least clients that you see. So if you see less new clients a month, obviously you have a better probability of that getting them all to return. Yeah. Um, we have some hairstylists out there that are seeing some 10, 20, 30 new guests a month. Now that's a lot harder, right? Cause you're seeing more people, but people say, well, how do I increase my retention? It is all about the guest experience. Yeah. It's all about from start to finish online booking. What does that look like for you? What is your, you know, your initial meeting and greeting process look like? Everything needs to have a system. How or who is talking to them over the phone? What do you have an intake form for them? How are, do they have robes? How are you directing them to your chair? The consultation, are you spending an extra 15, 30 minutes with new guests on their consultation, which you should be? What kind of relationship are you building with them, right? Because this is all of the stuff that is going to keep them. Are you willing to go above and beyond for your guests and do the things that other stylists are not? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's follow-up. Are you pre-booking them? Are you keeping in contact with them when they're gone and not in your chair for three months? Yeah. Are you in their face? Are you educating them? So there's a lot of things that go into that. And this is the stuff where suite owners and renters fall behind because it's a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. I guess it just email takes, marketing like, campaigns. Yeah. Setting up mm -hmm. systems, essentially yes. like figuring out like, Hey, what is a consistent thing that I'm going to be doing for every yes. single client? Yep. You got it. Yeah. Being consistent, showing up every single day as your absolute, ab absolute best. That is key. I mean, that's all that you can do. And a lot of self care has to come along with that too, because you're, you're putting a lot more of yourself in this business because it's yours. Yeah, for sure. I love it. Oh my gosh, you've shared so much good stuff with us. I especially love the part about creating a business plan that's realistic and that helps you to kind of see the future and plan right. where you want to go and be really clear about your numbers because at the end of the day, you are running a business and you need to make sure that you're making enough money and that yes. you're growing as well. Um, Nina, can you tell me just one last thing? What's one piece of business advice that you would give to someone who is looking at kind of going out on their own, something that you've learned from all of your years in the industry? Hmm. Someone that's looking to go out on their own. Um, I would say, well, a couple things. Be prepared, number one. Be prepared to have your life look like this. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're an entrepreneur, that's how your life looks. Yeah. Um, be prepared to put in the work and be okay with it. And I, I would say my number one tip would be to just be yourself, mm -hmm. be your authentic self, because that is when you attract your perfect clients. Mm -hmm. That is when you build the best relationships, show up every day as yourself and just be true to who you are. I just, I, I feel that's, that's just probably the most important thing. I mean, I can go on and talk about numbers and being secure, but be prepared, be prepared for the work, but also just be okay with who you are mm -hmm. and be and feel good about what you have to offer in terms of value yeah. for your guests. Yes, yeah. Yeah. We all have our own unique gifts and people appreciate yeah. us for everything that we are. So it's important to be able to make your personality and your characteristics, what makes you unique shine through in your business as well. I love that. Nina, thank you so much for chatting with thank me you. today. I absolutely loved it. Um, if someone is watching and wants to learn more about you and um, kind of how you can help them in their business, um, where can they find out about more about you? 
Sure. So I live on Instagram. <laughs> if you don't follow me yet, you will learn very quickly that I live on Instagram and my Instagram is just my name. So it's at Nina Tulio. And of course my website too, I have a lot of free downloads and guides and things that they can, um, look at and really kind of help them, uh, with stylists and owners and I have a uh, sweet owners checklist. So there's a lot of things that you can download for free and that's one and agency.com. So it's the number one and agency.com. I love that. Okay. Thank you so much for being with thank me you here so with much. us today, Nina, and we'll chat with you very soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.